Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to the Tolkien Road, episode 289. Greta, hey. we meet again. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed we do. That's amazing. We're meeting. <laughs> In this episode, we will be discussing chapter 10 of the Silmarillion of the Sundar. Before we get started, we'd like to give a double up air five to our patrons. Get those hands up. You've been duly warned. Three, two, one. Oh, Hope you got them up there. There we go. Need the vibes. There we, we go. We all need the vibes. Special thanks to this episode's executive producers, John R., Caitlin of T with Tolkien, and Jacob Lockham. Thanks, guys. Become a patron by visiting patreon.com slash Tolkien Road. Doing so gets you cool perks like 20% off of everything at truemythspress.com. Plus, your financial support helps keep the Tolkien Road to keep on evering on. Let's try, let's try it again. Plus, your financial support helps the Tolkien Road to keep on evering on. Got it right at that time. It's the morning time again, people. So, blah, 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 you know, yeah. all right. Learn more at patreon.com slash Tolkien Road. If you're on YouTube, hit that like button and don't forget to subscribe and let us know what's on your mind in the comments below. All right. And um, hey, Greta, mm -hmm. we got to, I forgot to ask you about this before we started. Can we do a live stream on Thursday, April 28th, Thursday this, this week, next week? I think we have something that night. Do we? I think we do. What do we have? Cause I don't see it. Oh, I think we have an event. An event. Mm hmm. For uh, Chesterton. Oh, okay. Well, uh, more to follow. More to follow on when we'll be scheduling that. So disregard. I meant to ask Greta about that, uh, but we're in kind of a we're in a little bit of a not a rush, but just uh. had to get down to had to get down to business this morning. So got a schedule to keep. Yes. So, indeed. but we will do a live stream. We month. will do a live stream. Yeah. We'll uh, we'll uh, get it all worked out when that's yeah. going to happen. All right. Well, let's dive on into chapter 10. Yes. I All right. We're on chapter 10 already. Yeah. Well, we're just, you know, making our way through, making it happen. Yeah. I feel like it's been a much easier read this time. Well, that'll happen when you read it before. I just remember, like, it's not as much as it's just easier, but it's like, I'm enjoying it a lot more too. Yeah. Like last time it felt like a chore, but this time I'm like, oh, I can't wait to read this so brilliant. It's definitely one of those books that rewards you upon more and more upon, you know, repeated reads. Right. So, um, yeah. you know, there are some that there's some books that like you read them the first time and it's just, you know, it's so good, but then maybe you read it a couple more times and not so much. This is the reverse of that. The Silmarillion challenge at first, mm -hmm. but once you've, you know, you're on your second, third, fourth read, it just gets better and better and better. better, and better. All right. Uh, let's, let's hit this quote of the week. Shall we? Mm -hmm. All right. But of bliss and glad life, there is little to be said before it ends. As works fair and wonderful, while they still they endure for eyes to see, are their own record. And only when they are in peril or broken forever do they pass into song. That, that quote really jumped out at me mm -hmm. um, from mm -hmm. this chapter. It, it kind of encapsulates the, uh, you know, the idea that this, this area of Beleriand had its own long uh, age of peace, if you will. And really there's not a whole lot that Tolkien has to say about that other than just like, it was really peaceful for a long time, mm. but it uh, doesn't seem to last forever. No. So I thought, I thought it was interesting. I like this quote too, because I think it was, um, it's really kind of interesting where it says, and only when they are in peril or broken forever, do they pass into song? Like, it just made me think like, that's so true. Like, I feel like we talk about um, like, like when things are good, and when you're enjoying them, like you don't really think about memorializing or, um, or really writing it down. Yeah. It's when things are hard and when, and when things start to go south, that, that, that that's when you start to, to remember the good times. Right. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, that's true. Unfortunately, yeah. that's true. Right. Um, but it just seems to be the nature of the good times and mm -hmm. the, uh, the nature of the bad times is that you tend to uh well you tend to remember i don't know that's a very pessimistic way of putting it but um you know i, I get what he's saying i get what he's saying here anyway right um, yeah i didn't know. mean to be pessimistic i was yeah. just saying that that's just kind of when we're in the good times like we tend to take them for granted mm -hmm. right and then when things were like you know aren't as good it's easy it, that's when you begin to think like oh man we had it really good back then Let's yeah think about it you know yeah yeah for sure yeah all right well Let's get into chapter 10, shall we? 
All right. Yeah, we shall. In chapter 10, the perspective shifts from the Blessed Realm to Beleriand, where it will remain for the rest of the Silmarillion. We jump back to where we left Beleriand, at the point when the Vanyar, Noldor, and Teleri all departed, leaving behind some of their brethren who become known as the Sindar and take the Teleri, Lord Elway, as their king and the Maya, Melian, as their queen. In chapter 10, we'll learn of the Sindar, the brethren of the Teleri that remained behind in Beleriand, of the creation of Minigroth, the grand palace of the Sindarin king, Thingol, of the coming of the dwarves to Beleriand, of the Nandoran elves, of the return of Melkor to Middle-earth and the first great battle of Beleriand, and much more. So a lot, of, lot going on in this chapter mm-hmm. again. Yeah. Uh, just a disclaimer, as with each episode, we won't be covering every detail of this chapter, but instead doing our best to hit the high points and unpack interesting and important details. If we miss something you guys want to discuss more, let us know. Mm-hmm. Great mm. place to do that to keep the conversation going is in the comments on YouTube. So, all right. So as I've been doing, um, we're talking about, we're, we're, I'm trying to give a timeline for uh, for each of the chapters in the Silmarillion. So far, I've been using History of Middle Earth Chapter 10 to do that. And actually this week and really going forward, we're going to be using History of Middle Earth Chapter 11, The War of the Jewels, to do that. And the reason for that is, is that Chapter 10 or Volume 10 really focuses on the, uh, the stories of the Blessed Realm, almost like the first half of the Silmarillion. It really focuses on that first half of the Silmarillion um and the timeline there and the development of those stories after lord of the rings and then volume 11 focuses on the development of the second half of the silmarillion after the lord of the rings so um and it you know we kind of think about that as like volume 10 is focused on the blessed realm volume 11 is focused on valeriand right um hmm. so the dividing line between chapters 10 or volumes 10 and 11 in history of middle earth is the great sea um so uh timeline where what are the years and can we kind of compare them to the timeline of that we've been using from volume 10 and the answer is yes we can compare them so really this takes place between the year of the trees 1200 and 1497 so a very long um 297 tree year period Mm. which equates to 2970 years uh sun years right as, as we would reckon them so um, and, and just to kind of frame that again, Melkor goes into captivity in the year 1100, year of the trees, 1100, right? He's taken into captivity roughly around the years of the year 1100. Um, and his captivity lasts for three ages, which an age is a hundred year tree years, right? So it lasts from 1100 to 1400 of the years of the trees. Um, we pick up the story here in the year 1200 years of the trees. Okay. Um, so the elves had become, had begun to make their journey to, uh, to the blessed realm between 1100 and 1200. All right. Of the years of the trees. Hmm. Um, during that period is when Thingol, um, goes into his trance when he sees Melian, right. He goes into his trance and, um, he doesn't actually come out of it until, um, uh, until, uh, it's like a 20 year period, something like that, that he, that he, he's in that trans 23 year period. So it's actually 200 years. Um, and he comes out of that and then he, uh, starts to lead the Sindar, right? Those, those are the elves who remain behind. Uh, but let's dive into just the story of the Sindar here. All right. Just a quick, quick summary, just to refamiliarize ourselves with who the Sindar, uh, actually are. Mm-hmm. Greta, would you read this? Sure. Now, as has been told, the power of Elway and Melion increased in Middle-earth, and all the elves of Beleriand, from the mariners of Círdan to the wandering hunters of the Blue Mountains beyond the river Gelion, owned Elway as their lord. Elu Thingol, he was called King Grey Mantle in the tongue of his people. They are called the Sindar, the Grey Elves of Starlit Beleriand. And although they were more quindy under the lordship of Thingol and the teaching of Melion, they became the fairest and the most wise and skillful of all the elves of Middle Earth. Yeah, so these are the elves that they made it all the way to Beleriand, but they never they never took the final journey. And most of them are Teleri. Uh, most of them are of the same house as the Teleri, right? So um, Elway meets Melion, is entranced, and then comes out of the trance 
and the Sendar take him for their king. He is renamed uh, Elu Thingol, which means King Grey Mantle. And, um, and then they learn a lot, right? They learn a lot because they have Melian as their queen, mm-hmm. right? So they actually have a, Who's a, know, Maiar? a Maiar as yeah. their queen. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's a, you know, that's, that's a great opportunity. They may not know, they may not become as knowledgeable as the elves of the blessed realm, but they become pretty knowledgeable, you know, as compared to the elves that never, you know, that never made it over the, the blue mountains. All right. And by the way, just, we'll get more into the geography of Beleriand, but just so you guys understand, if you look at the map of Beleriand um, in the Silmarillion, in the front or the back can i remember I it's, it's in the, the back, back. yeah, yeah. Um, if you look at the map basically the blue mountains on the very east right that's the same blue mountain range that's in the upper northwest of middle earth in the third age and that's kind of the the dividing line to the east for beleriand all right um so to the to the east of the arid luan of the blue mountains the terrain starts to become a lot more familiar we recognize a lot more things from the lord of the rings and from the hobbit right uh, we'll actually hear about some of those things in passing reference um, in this chapter, uh, some of those areas. Yeah, so that is, uh, that's who the Sindar uh, are. And then let's read, uh, let's read of the coming of the dwarves. And the dwarves come along in the year of the trees, 1250. They come to uh, Beleriand in the year 1250. So again, this is like basically... 1500 years of sun years after Melkor went into captivity, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So a long period has elapsed since then. All right. It came to pass during the second age of the captivity of Melkor that dwarves came over the blue mountains of Arid Luin into Beleriand. Themselves they named Khazad, but the Sindar called them Naugrim, the stunted people, and Gonhirim, masters of stone. Far to the east were the most ancient dwellings of the Naugrim. But they had delved for themselves great halls and mansions after the manner of their kind in the eastern side of Ered Luin. And those cities were named in their own tongue Gabil Gathol and Tumunzahar. To the north of the great height of Mount Dolmed was Gabil Gathol, which the elves interpreted in their tongue Belagost, that is, Mickleburg. And southward was delved Tumunzahar by the elves named Nograd, the Hollowbold. Greatest of all the mansions of the dwarves was Kazadum. The Dwaro Delf, Hadhondrond uh, in the Elvish tongue, that was afterwards in the days of its darkness called Moria. But it was far off in the mountains of mist beyond the wide leagues of Eriador, and to the Eldar came but as a name and a rumor from the words of the dwarves of the Blue Mountains. I'm glad you read that passage. Yeah, I was going to say this was <laughs> this is one I normally put on you just to mess with you. Um, no, so we, you know, we hear about these uh, in the Blue Mountains themselves, we have two dwarf kingdoms one in the like northern side of the range one in the southern side of the range and um and then we actually hear of of moria right mm-hmm. of casa doom mm-hmm. uh which of course plays you know an important role in lord of the rings uh but it's been around since the earliest you know uh really really going way back into the early first age right so we don't get a lot more information about it here in uh in the silmarillion but we do know that exists at this time. Mm-hmm. And we have reference to the mountains of mist, the misty mountains. Um, we have reference to Eriador. And, um, you know, so these regions all do exist. Uh, mm-hmm. It's just, they're not in focus during this, uh, during the Silmarillion. We also hear of Mickelberg. Mickelberg. Yeah. Which I think is very funny because it doesn't like, it sounds like a small town in Pennsylvania or something. I was, I was thinking too, I was like, <laughs> There might be a town. There must be a town in Pennsylvania named Mickleburg or something. <laughs> Were you because thinking Pennsylvania I, was thinking, too? I was thinking Pennsylvania too. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. hilarious. We're yeah. gonna get, we're gonna get a note from a listener who lives in Mickleburg, Pennsylvania. That'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and then we then we then we're gonna learn that it's like you know a mining town or something like that, right? You know? Yeah, that's it like, could be. I mean, it could be in Pennsylvania. Right? Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So that's um, the dwarves in the year twelve fifty of the year of the trees. They come into Beleriand. And um, and they start to intermingle with the elves of that mm-hmm. region, and it, it and it sounds like the, the dwarves already have kind of their own, you know, really civilization going mm-hmm. at this point, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What were you gonna say? I was just gonna say that I this was probably pretty trippy for both the elves and the dwarves because like they both thought that they were like it, right? It would yeah. almost be like 
like us, like another civilization, like, like I, I would think of the aliens just like walking into our backyard or something like, Hey, we're here. And you're like, what? We thought only humans lived here, you know? Yeah. So I think it must've been really like a, a kind of surreal for both the dwarves and the elves because they each were kind of insular before this. And then all of a sudden their worlds collide. And I think it's awesome how, and we'll get into this in a minute, but they like get along really well. And yeah. They like, they, you know, they seem to complement each other, you know, and um, seem to work together. I, I, I feel like we've probably talked about this before on the podcast, but there's this phenomenon called un the uncanny valley. And um, basically the idea is that as you get closer and closer to it, there, there's this graph. I'll try to remember to put this in the notes because it's really interesting to think about. But basically there's like this idea that as you go from uh, like the most like basic robot all the way to like increasingly complex humanoid, like kind of looking things, right. All the way to like what a, like, nor like what an actual, a normal human being it's, it's actually a normal human being. There's like this spectrum where, you know, it's like, Oh, cute, cute, cute. And then you hit this point where it's so close to humanity, but you can tell it's not actually human. And, but it's, it's like close enough to where you're like, uh, not cool. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you, and it's, that's called the uncanny Valley. So it's like, huh. you know, it's like, Oh, it's like, you know, uh, you know, Robbie, the robot little, like, obviously not a human, right. You know, like teddy bear, right. Um, you know, like obviously not human, obviously not human. Wait, is that human? It doesn't look human, but it kind of looks human or I don't like it. Right. And it gets close. And it's like, there's like these negative emotions that are associated with like negative reactions associated with it. So it's like this weird mm -hmm. effect where it goes, it's like too close for comfort. Right. Um, like everything's just fine right. until you get just close enough but it's just enough to kind of make you go Ooh. yeah it's like something's not right yeah yeah you don't look right yeah you know? yeah um it's it's an interesting i don't it's know very I, interesting i'll, I'll try to remember to, to link to this on um on uh it's a, a the wikipedia article on this because it's just an interesting little phenomenon to to think about but um but yeah i think maybe they're i, I think we do see some of this with the elves and their interactions both with dwarves and with men right mm. you know there's uh with dwarves there's maybe more of that effect because they were you know they're they're like the uh they call them the stunted the people stunted right people yeah and they're like wait a minute you just don't look right mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and um uh you know it's like the elves already have enough of a superiority complex i'm sure but uh you know, they, they, they meet the dwarves and they're like, you know, well, we're obviously so much more beautiful than you and your language is weird and all this kind of stuff. Right. Um, and then, you know, men come along and there's a whole nother thing because men maybe look even more like elves than dwarves do. So right. anyway, right. I, that just, your comments there made yeah. me, uh, made me think of the uncanny Valley here. Yeah, so I'll have to remember to put that very, into the show notes. Very interesting. And the elves and dwarves probably had less in common than like elves and men. Right. I mean, I think the uncanny, uncanny Valley may have been more of a thing between elves and men than between elves and dwarves, but. Well, you could argue that the, that men are so close that they're, they're back up like close to oh, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But, um, but you get to, with with something like all right so it'll be a little morbid here but like you know if you've been to a funeral open casket funeral and you've seen you know the body of the person that's in that uh you know the corpse right there's kind of that effect right because every time i go to one right and you know i'm like it's that i can tell it's that person but it doesn't really look like mm -hmm. that person because there's nothing animating it it's like right. it's it, yes. it is an empty mm -hmm. it feels like an empty body you know mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um and there's, it's obviously, you know, been a lot of like makeup and that kind of stuff done. And there's probably been fluids put in there. I don't know. I'm not an, you know, I don't do all of that work, so I don't know what goes on with it, but I know there's some things that they have to do to make the body look presentable. Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, and so they actually point that out on this little graph here, the, like corpse is like the bottom point of the yeah, uncanny the valley, valley. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's kind of, so I would think like with dwarves, there may be that effect even more. Like, like men might look close enough to elves that it's almost like indistinguishable, mm. right? Mm. Um, especially yeah. men in the prime of their life, right? That's true. But dwarves, it's like, 
you know, at least the depictions that we normally see of dwarves in Middle Earth, they're kind of funny looking compared to yeah. elves and and men, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So anyway, and obviously orcs would be in a it's like a low point here. Probably. Well, yeah, the, and orcs are almost like a member. They have two. They actually have two things here. They have two like little uh, lines on this graph. Uh, the straight the straight line, the corpse is the bottom point, and it doesn't go as far down. But then you have zombie on the like. It, it's almost like this is the artificial humanity line mm-hmm. and zombie goes even further down. So I have to think like orc would be orc, even, further even further down, down the on the yeah. uncanny. So it's like dwarves would be like maybe like coming back up from corpse, but mm-hmm. still maybe a little bit of a negative. And then orcs would be like all the way down where zombie is. Like down. at the very base. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, yeah. So Anyway, I, I've always yeah. been fascinated by that idea. Yeah, um, it's, it's so interesting. a little yeah. bit of a sidetrack, but I think it, I think it's relevant. Absolutely, you know? I agree. Um, yes. All right, so back on track. Uh, let's talk about Menegroth. So the year, we've met the dwarves, and then in the year of the trees, 1300, um, we learn about the construction of Menegroth. So Greta, can you read mm-hmm. uh, this part right here, and then I'll read the rest of it right yes. here. Yes. Now, Melian had much foresight after the manner of the Maiar, and when the second age of the captivity of Melkor had passed, she counseled Thingol that the peace of Arda would not last forever. He took thought, therefore, how he should make for himself a kingly dwelling and a place that should be strong, if evil were to awake again in Middle-earth, and he sought aid and counsel of the dwarves of Belagost. Therefore, the Nalgrim labored long and gladly for Thingol, and devised for him mansions after the fashion of their people, delved deep in the earth. Where the Esgalduin flowed down and parted Neldoreth from, Re- from Region, there rose in the midst of the forest a rocky hill, and the river ran at its feet. There they made the gates of the Hall of Thingol, and they built a bridge of stone over the river by which alone the gates could be entered. Beyond the gates, wide passages ran down to high halls and chambers far below that were hewn in the living stone, stone many and so great that the dwelling was named Menegroth, the Thousand Caves. Um... So Melian tells Thingol, look, this peace isn't going to last forever, right? And I know it's, you know, we've had 1500 years of peace at this point, but it's time to get, you know, we, we need to prepare for the worst, right? Um, something is going to happen. <laughs> something always happens. So uh, Thingol's wise, mm-hmm. and he says, well, I better listen to Melian, uh, because not only is she really beautiful, but she's also really smart. And uh, so he decides to build this, um, Mm -hmm. he decides to build this cave with the help of the dwarves. And so they delve the Menegroth, the thousand caves. And that is the, um, really, that's kind of the center of Thingol's kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's the place from which he rules. Sounds like quite a fortress. Yeah. Yeah. Well protected. And yeah. Yeah. The dwarves kind of outdid themselves. So that is, um, that, that is completed in the year 1300, year of the trees, 1300. And so this is, this is 200 year tree years into the captivity of Melkor, 2000 years of sun, 2000 years of sun, 2000 sun years. There we go. Um, and, um, you know, we're still, we're still a hundred tree years, a thousand years out from the, uh, you know, out from the release of Melkor, right? So, you know, still kind of a long, a long ways of where, from where we left off in terms of time and the last chapter. All right. Um, and then it's not too long after that, that evil does in fact return to Beleriand. All right. But it's not quite, it's not quite Melkor slash Morgoth yet. Right. But it is, uh, it is going to be some of his works. So mm-hmm. Greta, would you read yeah. uh, this first chapter here? And I'll read this or first paragraph or the second paragraph. But as the third age of the captivity of Melkor drew on, the dwarves became troubled, and they spoke to King Thingol, saying that the Valar had not rooted out utterly the evils of the north, and now the remnant, having long multiplied in the dark, were coming forth once more and roaming far and wide. There are fell beasts, they said, in the land east of the mountains, and your ancient kindred that dwell there are flying from the plains to the hills." And ere long, the evil creatures came even to Beleriand, over passes in the mountains or up from the south through the dark forests. Wolves there were, or creatures that walked in wolf shapes, and other fell beings of shadow. And among them were the orcs, who afterwards wrought ruin in Beleriand. But they were yet few and wary, and did but smell out the ways of the land, awaiting the return of their lord. 
Whence they came or what they were, the elves knew not then, thinking them perhaps to be Avari, who had become evil and savage in the wild, in which they guessed all too near, it is said. So, um, you know, we'll recall that Melkor had his prime, his prime abode in Atumno, which was at the north, kind of in the north center of this main landmass of uh, Middle Earth, right? Um, and that was, you know, the, the dungeons of it were like kind of thrown up when the, uh, when the uh, Valar came and they did battle with Melkor and took him captive. They kind of, un, you know, unearthed everything and like, you know, just, mm-hmm. you know, just destroyed Autumno, right? Mm-hmm. But all these like creatures that Melkor had made, um, a lot of them maybe got away and they started to multiply again and you give them enough time and there's going to be a lot more of them, right? So they're, they're, they start coming back really in the, you know, to the east, right? To the east of the Blue Mountains. And they start harassing the elves that are still over there. They start harassing other other uh, good creatures that are over there. And um, and then eventually they make their way back into Beleriand, right? Yeah. And uh, and then you've also got Angband right there, right? Which was where once upon a time, uh, Sauron was kind of was kind of ruling and, you know, as the as Melkor slash Morgoth's chief lieutenant, right? Now we don't hear anything about Sauron in this chapter. But, you know, one wonders if maybe he was behind some of this, right? So, you know, he's just waiting for uh, Morgoth to return. And, um, uh, you know, he's kind of doing what evil he can while, you know, while Morgoth is gone. So um, uh, we we do get this reference. Um, we, we get this reference to the elves uh, not knowing where the orcs had come from, thinking that perhaps to be a Vari who had become evil and savage in the wild in which they guessed all too near. Right. So other brethren yeah. elves who had stayed much further behind, wondering if these were where the orcs came from. So, no, again, another reference to the orcs being, um, you know, at least the original orcs being elves that were corrupted, right? Captured by Melkor and corrupted and turned into these kind of fell creatures. So, um, but the good news is that Thingol's company is armed by the dwarves. They, they, uh, they get weapons from the dwarves, they learn how to use these weapons. And they drive off these creatures of evil, right? So they, you know, here in the year 1330 of the year of the trees, they uh, they secure peace once again, even though it looks a little perilous for a bit there, they secure peace once again for this region of Beleriand by driving off these uh, these evil creatures. Thanks to the dwarves' help. Thanks to the dwarves' help. That's right. right. That's right. Yeah. But but Thingol in the process, Thingol and his, and his company become pretty stout warriors themselves right. in the process, right? Yeah. They literally, and, and, you know, that's something to remember, right? The elves are not warlike peoples, right? Yeah. They learn warfare through the course of their history. Um, remember with the story of, and that takes place in the blessed realm, you know, there aren't weapons in the blessed realm until no towards the end, them. right? Until towards yeah. the end and mm-hmm. the Noldor start creating weapons, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, so the Noldor, do learn start to learn weaponry and learn the art of warfare and then the sendar uh learn the art of warfare as well Mm -hmm. right here in this kingdom so Mm -hmm. but you know it's a good thing that thingol does learn this because he needs to protect the sendar right he needs to protect his people in his region uh and make it this realm of peace all right all right then next we learn about the coming of the nondor all right so just to give you a little perspective again here on the nondor we can go to our elf our um our groups of elves table, right? In the appendices. And the very last uh, table here, we look at the Quindy and the Nondor are descended from the Teleri. They're actually a part of the Teleri, but they left off from the Teleri even earlier than the Sendar did, right? So the Nondor left off around the river Anduin, right? The great river. Okay. The river Anduin, of course, being the one that plays a major part in the Lord of the Rings, right? Um, it's the river that runs through uh, between the Misty Mountains on the east. It, it has the Misty Mountains on the west side of it, and then Mirkwood uh, on the east side of it, right? And it runs down all the way through the through that continent, um, past uh, through Asgiliath, right? Mm-hmm. And um, and it's the river that the Fellowship journeys on um, uh, for after it leaves um, after it leaves Lothlorien, all right. Uh, so this is, you know, the great river. It's the very same river, right. That we are going to read about right here. Um, all right. So Greta, could Mm -hmm. you read this passage right here? Yes. 
<clears throat> now has been told one Lenway of the host of Elway forsook the march of the Eldar at that time when the Teleri were halted by the shores of the great river upon the borders of the westlands of Middle Earth. Little is known of the wanderings of the Nandor, whom he led away down Anduin. Some, it is said, dwelt age long in the woods of the Bale of the Great River. Some came at last to its mouths and there dwelt by the sea, and yet others passing by Ired Nimras, the White Mountains, came north again and entered the wilderness of Eriador between Ered Luin and the far mountains of Mist. Now these were a woodland people and had no weapons of steel, and the coming of the fell beasts of the north filled them with great fear, as the Nogrim declared to King Thingol in Menegroth. Therefore Denethor, the son of Lenwe, hearing rumor of the might of Thingol and his majesty and of the peace of his realm, gathered such hosts of his scattered people as he could and led them over the mountains into Beleriand. There they welcomed, then there they were welcomed by Thingol as king long as kin long lost that return, and they dwelt in Osiriand, the land of seven rivers. All right, I know what you're thinking. But this is not I that know, Denethor. I was yes, I I was a little confused for a minute this is not that denethor that denethor right the denethor you all know from lord of the rings uh the denethor you all know and despise from lord of the rings um is the steward of gondor and the late third age and he is a man right mm. he is not an elf this is an elf this is uh and, and you're going to see certain names pop up again right so you can one can surmise that like they were you know, maybe Denethor was named with respect to this Denethor. I'm not sure, mm -hmm. but, um, but you'll see certain names pop up more than once and being used by certain characters more than once, which is normal. I mean, we do that in our mm -hmm. world. Right. Um, so uh, that is not the same Denethor. This is the, this is the son of the leader of the Nondor, right. Of this group of elves that broke off. And so this group of elves had broken off on that journey many, you know, many, year, many, many years ago. Right. And, um, and they had dwelt in really Eriador, right? Um, in that region where we think of as being the home of uh, like the hobbits, right? So Greta, here's the mm -hmm. third age map, right? Eriador right there, okay. Shire's right here. Mm -hmm. So Beleriand is over here somewhere, okay? Where it's now underwater in the third age, okay. right? And then the Nandor would have dwelt in this region, right? Between the Blue Mountains on the West and the Misty Mountains on the East. And they start having problems and they're like, let's go see if we can find the rest of our kin. And that's how they get into Beleriand and they're welcomed by Thingol. So, yeah. Which I think is awesome. Yeah. 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 So far you're like, oh, this Thingol guy, he seems like a pretty good guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he didn't have to, he didn't have to let them in, but he did. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And Thingol is a pretty good guy at first. He's a pretty good guy, but uh, that's kind of going to change as the story goes on. All right. Um, and so with the coming of the Nandor, we have really this period of bliss that we referred to in the quote of the week, right? Um, it lasts from the year 1350 of the year of the trees to the year 1495, the year 1495 being the year that dun, 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 Melkor slash Morgoth returns to Beleriand. All right. But that is a 145 tree year period, which means it is 1,450 years. So that's a long period of time again, right? Uh, 14, you know, uh, 1,450 years ago from right now would have been uh, like around the year 500, right? Uh, rough, roughly the year late, the late mm -hmm. 500s, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. you think about how much time has elapsed in our own history, how much happened in that period of time in our own history. You realize how long a period of time that actually is that they have this uh, period of bliss. Okay. Um, so we don't know much about that. Uh, one would presume that lots of things happened during that period that we just aren't big enough for us to have he heard about with the grand arc of this story but um there you have it all right um and so we we jump forward way forward and we hear about the return of um ungoliant dun, dun, uh, dun. and more and we hear about the return of melkor slash morgoth who really we'll just start referring to as morgoth morgoth to uh beleriand along with ungoliant right where we left off with them they had that big fight the balrogs had to come to morgoth's rescue and he had that terrible scream, which like filled the whole continent of Beleriand with like terror. And, um, and we hear about that here. Okay. Um, I'm not going to rehash all that because we did talk about it in the last chapter. Kind of rehashes it in the chapter here. Um, 
but let's read about what happened. We, we don't, we do learn a little bit more about what happened with Ungoliant. So Greta, do you mm -hmm. want to read about this right here? Sure. Soon afterwards, Ungoliant fled from the North and came to the realm of King Thingol and the terror of darkness was about her, but by the power of Melion, she was stayed and entered not into Neldoreth, but abode long time under the shadow of the precipices in which Dorthonian fell southward. And they became known as Ered Gorgoroth, the mountains of terror and none dared go thither or pass nigh them. Their life and light were strangled and their all waters were poisoned. Yeah. Don't want to go to there. Yeah. Not, not, mm. do not want to go to there. It's not, not a, not an up and coming vacation spot. No, 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 mm -hmm. no. All right. So we can kind of, uh, we can kind of get an idea. So we look at the map at the at the back of the Silmarillion. You've got this in the in the very north, in the center, in the very north. And it, unfortunately, in my edition, in this edition we're using here, it's like split between two pages. But in the middle, you've got the Anfauglith, uh, kind of this open space at the top. Uh -huh. um, Angband is to the north of that, right? Angband is, to, is I don't know why they didn't put Angband on this map, but it's to the north of that. And then you've got this uh, Tauter new uh Tarnufuin, right? Um, and then non non Dungortheb and the Ered Gorgoroth, right? So these mountains that Ungoliant goes and dwells in are um on the you can kind of see them between where it says Tarnufuin, Dorthonion, and non Dungortheb right there in the middle. And it says Ered Gorgoroth. So that would have been the mountains where she uh took up her abode for some period of time, the mountains of terror. Um, and then you can look a little further south from there and you'll see the region that is the center of Thingol's kingdom, which we're going to read about next, which is Doriath. And that is, uh, that is the location of, uh, of Menegroth. Although I'm trying to find Menegroth on this map. Hmm. Well, it's, it, say, is it there? I don't know. Yeah. And sometimes, again, sometimes they do these weird things with this map where they don't mark the most like, important things that you want to know where they are. Um, go figure oh yeah that there it is i see it so it's right here above the a in doriath oh, yes. right or yep. above the t in doriath mm -hmm. it says minigroth right there yes okay yeah so um all right well let's read about the um so after ungoliant goes there melkor returns to his throne and then it's it's not very long it's only basically two tree years so basically about 20 years from when morgoth takes up his abode in angband to when he declares war on balerion right so he's ready to get Back. he's ready to get back into the action against um against any elves he can find can i make a comment super yeah. quick about melion staying on goliant yeah um i mean they're both Maiar, right well we believe on well, we believe by yeah. on and Maiar. okay um yeah so i was just gonna say that clearly not all my are created equal if melion is able to stay on goliant right yeah i will say that um you know the whole thing about on goliant being able to um it's inter it is really interesting that, that like Ungoliant is um, is able to kind of best Morgoth, mm -hmm. but I think the you know what we learned about Morgoth is that he is just as he continues to pour all of his energy into the creation of these like fell beasts and everything. It's like he 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 loses more and more of of his own like po potency, right? And he becomes weaker and weaker at, over the course of mm -hmm. the story, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Whereas she has been swelling with all this, like consuming all this light, right? You know, the, the light of the two trees. Um, she's been swelling more and more, right? With this, uh, with this strange energy. Um, but Melion has not, you know, she has not been doing, you know, she has not been pouring her life's energy into all these different things like uh, Morgoth has. Also, she uses different tactics, right? I mean, she's not like going and doing war with Ungoliant directly, but she's using a certain, a, a certain, different kind of skill right to keep ungoliant at bay right mm -hmm. um so yeah i mean it doesn't give us a lot of detail on that but you know she is using her own um her own set of skills her own brand of magic if you will to keep ungoliant at a distance i feel right? like maybe she's kind of like the scarlet is it the scarlet no not the scarlet witch oh i get them no, mixed a, up is well, it the, the thing of the scarlet witch the one from the marvel yeah, who was it? Um, oh, geez, this is embarrassing. The series that we watched. Yeah, this is Scarlet Witch. Is that Witch. Scarlet yeah. Witch? Okay. 
Um, well, I, I, they gave it, they had a different name for it. It, it was called WandaVision. WandaVision. Yeah. Yes. But okay. that she is the Scarlet Witch. She's the Scarlet yeah. Witch. Okay. I get her in Black Widow mixed up. I know. That's terrible. Um, yeah. But that's kind of how I picture it. Like she kind of puts like force fields kind of like, you know. Yeah. Against Uncle Land. I think, I think there's something to be said for that. Right. I think, um, you know, and, and I think we see more of that in the, uh, in this next section right here that we're about mm-hmm. to read we see what she does. She creates this thing called, uh, called the girdle of Melian. Uh, but let's read about why she does that. So um, do you want to read this first paragraph here? And then sure. I'll read the second. Now the orcs that multiplied in the darkness of the earth grew strong and fell and their dark Lord filled them with the lust of ruin and death. And they issued from Angban's gates under the clouds that Morgoth sent forth and passed silently into the highlands of the North. Thence on a set, thence on a sudden, a great army came into Beleriand and assailed King Thingol. Now in his wide realm, many elves wandered free in the wild or dwelt at peace in small kindreds far sundered. And only about Menegroth in the midst of the land and along the Phalas in the country of the Mariners were their numerous peoples. But the orcs came down upon either side of Menegroth and from camps in the east between Kela. Ceylon and Kalon and Gelion, and west in the plains between Sirion and Nargog, they plundered far and wide, and Thingol was cut off from Cirdon at El- Elglarest. Therefore, he called upon Denethor, and the elves came in force from region from Regian, Regian, beyond Aros, and from Osirion, and fought the first battle in the wars of Beleriand. And the eastern host of the orcs was taken between the armies of the Eldar, north of the Androm, and midway between Aros and Gelion. And and there they were utterly defeated. And those that fled north from the great slaughter were waylaid by the axes of the Nogrim that issued from Mount Dolmed. Few indeed returned to Angband. But the victory of the elves was dear bought, for those of Osiriand were light armed and no match for the orcs, who were shod with iron and iron shielded, and bore great spears with broad blades. And Denethor was cut off and surrounded upon the hill of Aman Ereb. There he fell and all his nearest kin about him before the host of Thingol could come to his aid. Bitterly, though his fall was avenged, when Thingol came upon the rear of the orcs and slew them in heaps, his people lamented him ever after and took no king again. After the battle, some returned to Osiriand, and their tidings filled the remnant of their people with great fear, so that thereafter they came never forth in open war, but kept themselves by wariness and secrecy. And they were called the Lyaquindi, the green elves, because of their raiment of the color of the leaves. But many went north and entered the guarded realm of Thingol and were merged with his people. Um, all right, so kind of a Kind of a sad end to the remainder of the Nondor there. Uh, some of them do join with the people of Thingol. Some of them kind of become this like just remnant that live in the woods and they're kind of this strange, strange group of elves, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, very big first battle of Beleriand. Um, and it's, uh, you know, we, we get Cirdon and his people driven all the way to the shores and uh, and, you know, kind of a victory maybe on the Eastern front, but, you know, a stalemate, a, a loss with a little bit of a stalemate on the Western front. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is all taking place in the year 1497 of the year of the trees, by the way, the distance, uh, it does say the distance between Angband and Menegroth in, uh, in the war of the jewels, it's actually 150 leagues, which if I understand the league correctly is, a league is one league is three miles. So it's 450 miles from Angband mm. to Menegroth. So not a, it's not super close. Yeah. Right. And you've got that, you know, those big mountain ranges in the middle that nobody wants to go through because Ungoliant and her uh, offspring live there. So they're coming down on either side of that mountain range. And those are the two different sorts of uh, sorts of fronts there. Um, but yeah. And so after this, and you, you know, you're scary when even orcs don't want to come to you where you live. That's right. That's right. Um, all right. And so uh, here's, what we, here's what we learned about the uh, girdle of Melian. And when Thingol came again to Menegroth, he learned that the orc coast in the west was victorious and had driven Cirdon to the rim of the sea. Therefore, he withdrew all his people that his summons could reach within the fastness of Neldoreth and Region. And Melian put forth her power and fenced all that dominion round about him with an unseen wall of shadow and bewilderment. 
the girdle of Melion, that none thereafter could pass against her will or the will of King Fingal, unless one should come with a power greater than the, that of Melion the Maya. And this inner land, which was long named Egla, El, Eglador, was after called Doriath, the guarded kingdom, land of the girdle. Within it there was yet a watchful peace, but without there was peril and great fear, and the servants of Morgoth roamed at will, save in the walled havens of the phallus. All right. Um, so, yeah, it, it describes Melion's power as uh, fin as un unseen wall of shadow and bewilderment, right? As she mm -hmm. fences this area of Doriath with this unseen wall of shadow and bewilderment. So, yeah, something like, you know, maybe what mm -hmm. we saw in that in WandaVision, right? With that, yeah. um, you know, this kind of like... Like invisible dome. Invisible dome put yeah. over this town, right? Um, maybe it's like an electric fence. Yeah, well, you know, I think something more graceful probably that yeah. Melian's doing than an electric I'd fence, but probably. But the concept is very similar. That's true. Yeah. Uh, so we do we get Kirdon dwelling over here in the phallus, which is to the far, you know, kind of the far west of the map. Um, Kirdon always dwelling by, you know, dwelling by the sea, right? Dwelling, <laughs> dwelling far on the on the shores of the sea to the west, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's where he seems to like to make his abodes. And uh, yes, this that is the same Kirdon that's around at, around at the end of the Third Age in uh, Lord of the Rings. Uh, he's just much younger at this point. So, um, so yeah, that's the that's the story of of the Sindar before the return of the Noldor to Beleriand, right? And the Sindar, Thingol, Melian, they will all play a very big role in the rest of the Silmarillion. Okay, um, so uh, that's. You know, that's where we leave off with this chapter. Um, one other thing I'll say is that the next two chapters, they're a bit more stage setting before the action really picks up again in chapter 13. Now, they're not super long, chapters 11 and 12, but they, we've, we've gone from having a few chapters now of like a lot of action after a lot of stage setting. There's still more say, stage setting that has to happen because we're back in Beleriand now, right? And there's some big changes that are happening to the world, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so we're going to get, we're going to get some stage setting in chapters 11 and 12. It's, it's interesting stuff. Don't get me wrong. It's interesting stuff, but we're not actually going to get back to really the action of the Noldor, uh, and the Sindar until chapter, uh, 13, mm -hmm. chapter 13, mm -hmm. and then pretty much a lot of action from then on. Right. So a lot of action from then on. So, um, that's the nature of the Silmarillion, right? Sometimes there's a lot of stage setting and sometimes there's a lot of action. It's a good balance. Yeah. 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 So I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. So all of this, um, the, this, this particular chapter closes mentioning Feanor um, and his burning of the ship to the Teleri. So is all of that, like, is that kind of happening, happening concurrently? Yes. Okay. Yeah. It, that happened in the year. Well, let me hear, look back at my, I don't have it right here, but anyway, oh. yes, that roughly it actually says here in the so history like the of Middle battle Earth. of the first battle of Beleriand was around the same time that the Noldor are. Yeah, it's actually in the same year, okay. 1497. Same year. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah, it says. Uh, now new tidings were at hand, which none in Middle Earth had foreseen. Neither Morgoth in his pits, nor Melian and Menegroth, for no news came out of Amon, whether by messengers or by spirit, or by vision and dream after the death of the trees and the hiding of Valinor, in this same year of the Valar but some seven years after in the later reckoning of time. So it's like in that year of the tree, but it's in, you know, within the period of that one year of the tree, it's like seven years later. Feanor came oversea in his white ships of the Teleri and landed in the, in the Firth of Dringist and there burned the ships at Loscar. Right. The right. so same general time period. Yeah. Year yeah. of the tree is 1497. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Cool beans. All right. Well, let's do a, uh, let's do a little haiku, shall we? Let's do it. All right. Rock. Paper, paper scissors, scissors shoot. shoot you gotta get your hand up we got people gotta uh, see it rock, rock paper, paper scissors, scissors shoot. shoot boom ah. you go first okay <clears throat> dwarves and elves align stars shine as silver fires Beleriand bliss nice i like that stars shine as silver fires tolkien would have loved that with all of actually its... tolkien wrote that <laughs> did he yeah it's in the chapter <laughs> oh man <laughs> that's hilarious wow i'm really impressed that you thought i i maybe came up with that on my own what <laughs> you know uh but maybe i should have kept my mouth shut and just taking credit 
It's like taking that store-bought cake on a pretty crystal platter. So everybody thinks you brought it, you made it yourself. That's right. That's right. <laughs> well, I liked uh, it anyway. Well, liked thank anyway. you. I'm glad. There is nothing new under the sun, as they say. All right. Here's mine. Okay. Evil chained, peace reigns, kingdoms rise and flourish free. A long day, yet doomed. Oh, that's good. I like that. Yeah, I was yeah. pretty happy with that one. Yeah, doesn't beat my silver fires though. You mean Tolkien silver yeah. fires? Yeah. Well, our T- Tolkien and my silver fires. Yeah, you just take credit. See, I I maybe took the words. But... Did, y'all, did y'all collaborate on that, Greta? Did y'all I come up with that did. together? I think we did. Well, I think he wrote the words, and then I just fit them perfectly into my haiku. I see. So okay. it works. Yeah. Yeah. Right collab. On. Yeah. All right, y'all get us your haiku. Get us your haiku. We recorded it again a little earlier this week. Um, but uh, so y'all get a, you got if, if you want it read on the episode, you got to get it in early, um, you know, really kind of a week ahead of time if you can. And, um, uh, and if not, if you're not able, you can still leave it in the comments below. Right. So uh, that's what I encourage you to do so that you can participate in the haiku. All right. Okay. You guys, that's, uh, that's about <laughs> it for this episode. Leave us a rating and review. Uh, if you're a five-star fan of the Tolkien Road, you can help us out by heading over to iTunes, your preferred source for the show, and dropping us a rating and review. When you do that, it helps get the word out about the Tolkien Road, which helps us to keep on evering on. Uh, and drop us a line. You can correspond us correspond with us in a number of ways. Check out the show notes to learn more. Uh, we'll do our best to respond to you somehow and at some point. All right. And we'll uh, we'll get back to you on that live stream. We'll get back to you. We'll figure that out and yeah, we'll uh, figure out the date there. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you to our amazing patrons, especially the following. John R. Caitlin of T with Tolkien. Jacob Lockham. Ms. Anonymous. Andrew T. Red Hawk. Shannon S. Brian O. Emilio P. Zeke F. James A. James L. Chris L. Chuck F. Aja V. Ish of the Hammer. Teresa C. David of Pints with Jack. Jonathan D. Eric S. Eric B. Johanna T. Mike M. Robert H. Paul D. Julia. Wertie. Matthew W. Joe Bagelman. Chris K. Jacob S. And Don J. As well as those celebrating their patron anniversary this month in April of 2022, Julia, Rebecca R, Jonathan D, and Ty M. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you all so much. And thanks to everybody for listening. We will talk at you next time. Bye, y'all. Bye-bye.